All right, so let's jump right in. If you're coming to the mandolin for the first time and you're wondering what's the big deal about these chop chords, there's actually a lot to unpack about this one little aspect of bluegrass mandolin playing. To start with, the chalkboard is strongly tied to the origins of bluegrass music. This shape dates all the way back to the mid-1900s when the father of bluegrass, Bill Monroe, was first inventing this really rhythmic, percussive way of playing, chopping on the backbeat to drive the rhythm of the band forward. And since then, the mandolin chop has become a huge part of what the bluegrass sound is today. The mandolin is often called the snare drum of the five-piece bluegrass band because while the bass is playing on the first and the third beats of the measure, the mandolin is playing in between on the second and the fourth beats playing on that backbeat much like a snare drum. That resulting boom chuck effect is really the rhythmic foundation for all the other bluegrass instruments to build on. And what makes these chord shapes so effective at filling this rhythmic role is that we're not using any open strings. That way we can choke or mute the strings immediately after playing the notes to make that percussive sound. Also, since these are closed position shapes, we can move these configurations up and down the neck to create new chords, but more on that in a bit. Now, some people might be tempted to use some other easier shapes to create the same effect, but there's something almost indescribable about how these chop chord shapes sound. There's a certain authenticity to these shapes that you can't get with any other chord shapes out there. Also, as we'll see later on, these particular shapes are really the key to unlocking all sorts of possibilities for your playing, like easily transposing from one key to the next, connecting double stops together, playing iconic bluegrass sounding licks, playing further up the neck, and so much more. So hopefully you can see why these are really important to get under your fingers early on, but even though they're standard chord shapes, they're crazy difficult to pull off, right? As a professional mandolin player and educator, I find it really frustrating that these are usually the first shapes that beginners are expected to learn without much direction on how to tackle this big challenge. So here are a bunch of tips that I think are helpful for building up dexterity and muscle memory to make these a lot easier. Okay, but let's just look at these first. Thankfully, there's only two shapes that we have to work with. We have the four finger shape and we have the three finger shape. Notice how closely related these two shapes are, right? The core of the shape comes down to your index, your middle, and your ring finger, and the shape stays the same from one chord to the next. All we're doing is we're moving up or down a string. All right, let's try these out now, and don't panic. I know it's a bit of a stretch at first, but these chord shapes are possible even for people with smaller hands, Sierra Hole being a prime example. I'm never gonna be able to make four finger G chords. Also, Mike Marshall has self-proclaimed sausage fingers, but is able to play these chords no problem. So it all just boils down to finger strength and familiarity. That being said, it's really important to establish a good left-hand posture to make this strenuous formation as comfortable as you can. And I think the best leverage and the best reach comes from tipping your fingers over at about a 45 degree angle from the fretboard. If your fingers are parallel to the frets, it's gonna make this shape even harder to reach. When making these shapes, it's really important to bend all the knuckles in your fingers to ensure that you're playing with your fingertips. Otherwise, you can have some muting issues happen when the fleshy part of your finger hits those adjacent strings. Also, for me, it always feels better to keep my wrist straight no matter what's going on, but chop chords are the one exception to the rule where it might be okay to choke up on the neck a little bit and bend your wrist in to make this feel a little bit more manageable. And if you're interested in even more left-hand technique ideas, check out this whole video that I did all about mandolin technique in the link above. So when you're first starting out on these shapes, I find it's really helpful to build up finger independence by laying each finger down one at a time in different orders. This way you're training your fingers where to go no matter what the context. So let's try this out with our four finger shape. This is our G major chop chord. Now let's make this chord one note at a time, starting on our highest note on the E string, working all the way down to the lowest note on the G. First, put your middle finger on the third fret of the E. Now we'll put our index finger on the second fret of the A string. Your ring finger goes on the fifth fret of the D string. And then lastly, put your pinky on the seventh fret of the G string. And for all these exercises, try to keep your fingers down once you've put them in place. And once they're all in place, see if you can play each set of strings individually to make sure that there's no buzzing or muting happening. All right, now let's try this in reverse order. First, put your little finger on the seventh fret of the G. Then we'll put our ring finger on the fifth fret of the D followed by your index finger on the second fret of the A, and then lastly, your middle finger on the third fret of the E string. 
Next, let's try putting your fingers down in order from left to right, starting with your index finger on the second fret of the A string, followed by your middle finger on the third fret of the E. Then we're going to skip up to that D string, and then lastly, stretching up to the seventh fret with your pinky again. You guessed it, we're going to try that in reverse order as well now. Starting off with your little finger on the seventh fret of the G again, you got your ring finger on the fifth fret of the D, your middle finger on the third fret of the E, and then finally, your A string second fret with your index finger. This may seem pretty simple at first, but chances are you're gonna find one of these approaches more difficult than the others. So be sure to hone in on your weaknesses and make sure that you can do all four approaches with the same dexterity and the same fluidity. Next, instead of thinking about these as four unrelated notes, it really helps me to identify smaller shapes and finger spacings within the bigger chord to use as visual building blocks. And one of the best ways to do this is to identify the double stops that occur naturally within this chord shape. So we're gonna break things down into two note chunks. So first up, let's look at the third fret on your E string with your middle finger and the second fret on the A string with your index. Just remember that these are on adjacent strings and adjacent frets. And if you've played any open chords before, you know that this is your basic open G chord, so pretty easy to remember. Next on the middle two strings, we have second fret on the A with your index, followed by your ring finger on the fifth fret of the D string. This is a little bit different because they're on adjacent strings, but now you have two frets of space between your two fingers. Try to burn this shape into your memory. And last, we got your D and your G strings on the fifth and the seventh frets. Now you only have one fret of space between your fingers. All right, now try playing through these double stops one at a time in order so that you're building up muscle memory for these smaller building blocks to get a bigger picture of that chop chord as a whole. Now, once you've done all that, we're gonna practice putting down all four fingers at once. This is really important to make sure that you can smoothly and quickly change from one chord shape to the next, especially in those faster tempos that we're forced to play in and all those bluegrass jams. And that's all there is to this exercise. Once you've got your G chord position, just practice lifting all four fingers up at once and then placing them all four back down where they need to be. Up and down, up and down. And maybe the best way to practice all of these exercises is just to put on your favorite TV show and mindlessly practice this for a while. You don't even have to use your right hand. Just practice putting your fingers down in place again and again to build that muscle memory. I'm actually a huge supporter of TV practicing. Something about this passivity actually helps us play a lot better. But back to these standard chop chords, right? We've only been talking about the four finger shape so far, but I haven't forgotten about that three finger shape too. And this one's so easy by comparison. Like I mentioned before, these shapes are super similar. Let's start off by making that four finger chop chord shape. Now keep your fingers on the same frets with the same spacing, but move the whole shape up one string towards the ceiling. Now you should have your middle finger on the third fret of the A, your index on the second fret of the D, your ring finger on the fifth fret of the G string, and your pinky is off the hook. This is your C major chop chord. Now you can repeat all those exercises that we use for the four finger shape here, but I think you'll find this three finger shape will probably come a lot easier. The only challenge to this shape is that you don't want that E string to ring out. Even if the E note fits with the chord you're playing, you don't want it to ring over the percussive sound of the chop. I get around this by keeping my little finger resting lightly on the E strings to mute them without creating a new note. And I think this is probably the most foolproof approach. That way you can strum through all four sets of strings without worrying about that open string sound. All right, last point here, and perhaps the most important one, is that you can use these shapes as movable frameworks to find other chords. In other words, since these chords don't use any open strings, if you keep your finger spacings the same, you can move that shape up and down the neck to find other major chords. There are basically two ways of doing this. And first, you already know your G and your C major chop chord. So if you move one of these chop chord shapes up one fret, you've already got a new chord. So one fret up from G would be G sharp, then one fret up from there would be A, then B flat, then B, and so on. Same with this three finger shape. One fret up from C would be C sharp, then D, then E flat, and E, etc. But the second way of identifying new chords with these shapes is maybe a little bit more useful. All you have to do is find the root notes in the chop chord shape, so that way you can identify new root notes for these chords you're looking for and build the shapes around those notes. So take this four finger G chop chord again, you'll notice that we actually have two roots in this shape. One on your ring finger on the D string and then another on your middle finger on the E string. So if I wanna use this shape for another chord, say a B major chord, 
All I have to do is find a B note with my ring finger on the D string or my middle finger on the E string, and the chord just builds itself. And the same is true for this three finger shape. The roots of the chord are still on my ring finger and on my middle finger, but I'm just on different strings now. So if I wanna build an F major chord using this three finger shape, all I have to do is find an F note on the G string with my ring finger or an F note on my middle finger on the A string. And just a little disclaimer here, to do this well, it really helps to know the chromatic scale. Basically, the order in which the notes, the sharps, and the flats appear in order from one fret to the next. And I've got another video about that too. You can check it out at the link above. And one last perk about these chord shapes that'll blow your mind is that you can easily change from a major to a minor chord just by changing one note in this configuration. If you lower your index finger by one fret, you've got it. So here's an A major to an A minor for your four finger shape. And here's a D major to a D minor for your three finger shape. It's just that easy. So now you've got the tools necessary to figure out any major or minor chop chord that your heart desires. And I think it is really helpful to be able to figure it out like this. But if you're looking for even more guidance, I've got a PDF handout over on my Patreon page with fretboard diagrams for every possible chop chord out there. Whatever floats your Cheerios. Well, there you go. I uh, hope this was a helpful guide to you as you start your journey to unlocking the bluegrass chop chord, but there's still a lot left to cover, so I hope that you'll stick around for future installments in this series. And did I mention the subscribe and the notification button? That goes a long way. In part two coming up, we'll be looking at how to strum these chords, as well as how to transition from one shape to the next seamlessly in a chord progression. And beyond that, we'll be looking at how to make that iconic bluegrass bark sound when you're chopping. We'll be looking at how to use double stops in these shapes, how to play iconic bluegrass licks using this formation, so lots to come. Until then, you guys keep on chopping and I'll see you soon.